All right, so in this part of the beginner's guide, what we're gonna do is take a look at how we can create some basic animations and work in our timeline, along with talking about the different keyframe types. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so blank Cinema 4D file here. And when it comes to talking about animation, uh, it's important to know the different parts of the user interface we're going to need to interact with. Now, quite a few of these are already visible to us and they're underneath our perspective view. So we have our playback controls. We can play, pause, go to next frame, next key, as well as the end and kind of the same backwards as well. Um, we have some other options for cycling and what we want the frame rate to be, though not terribly important. You can also see what the active frame rate uh, frame is and that allows you to see where your playhead or time slider is These next group of icons deal with different ways of creating animation whether it's record active objects or auto king I really don't use these a whole lot though auto king has been improved relatively recently instead I like to use radio buttons uh, which I will uh, show you what those are very soon underneath all of that stuff we ha have our frame range I've already talked about our playhead or time slider. This frame range um, is the amount of time we are currently looking at in our project. Now, there's kind of a couple of different ways you can work with this here, um, because below that we also have our preview range, which allows us to kind of zoom in on um, different areas of our frame range or whatever length of time we want to set our animation to. This is very similar to After Effects if you've ever used that. Um, and you can change the length of your preview range by typing in um, these values here. Actually, that's the um, overall frame range, uh, but your preview range can be adjusted to match it or like I said, zoom in and see a different part of it. And so all of that is very important um, when working with animations. It's also important to realize we are looking at 30 frames per second um, by default in Cinema 4D. So each 30 frames here is one second. Um, that's actually something you can change in your project settings. You can see it right here, frames per second. If you wanted to change it to say 24 or 60, uh, that is however also something you need to adjust or at least make sure it adjusts um, in your render settings. It's been a long time since I've actually changed it uh, and you can see it doesn't actually update there. So uh, important to think about. Okay, I'm going to create just a cube here. I will create a bend and a camera. Okay, now I'm not really concerned with where these objects are, what they're doing, because what I want to show you is the primary way I recommend creating keyframes. And that is using uh, what used to be called radio buttons. I still refer to them as radio buttons, it, but it's these little diamond icons, these little keyframe icons here. Okay, um, and you will see these keyframed icons or places we can add keyframes pretty much to, uh, next to every property in your attribute manager here. So that's the, your coordinates, your position, rotation, scale. If it's a primitive object like a cube, you can see we have uh, the ability to keyframe size, segments, really any property that is currently you know enabled or active. And shoot, even the fong tags. So tags as well have those radio buttons. They can be animated. If you were to look at a, a deformer, same thing. Deformer's position, rotation, scale, all of its Object properties here can be keyframed and animated. Same with a camera, a camera's position, rotation, scale, not so much. Uh, in the project tab, I'm sorry, in the object proper, uh, properties, you do, can animate things like focal length as well as field of view, focus distance for doing depth of field, all of that good stuff. Uh, one last thing, if I just create a basic material, um, oh, I guess it's a redshift material, but you will notice in the attribute manager here next to the base properties, all of those have that same keyframe icon, the ability to be keyframed there as well. So pretty much any object, anything you create in Cinema 4D, if it shows up in your attribute manager, aside from project settings and render settings, um, you can keyframe it. So what we're gonna do is just keep this cube here and worry about keyframing it. Okay, I'm gonna make sure I have my object selected. I'm gonna make sure I'm at the right frame where I want to create my first keyframe. That'll be frame zero. And actually I'll go ahead and shorten my preview range here to something a little bit more manageable for a simple animation like 50 frames. We then want to come in and figure out what property it is we want to animate. And if it's position, you can 
Um, just kind of see what it is as you move your object or rotate it. In this case, it will be Z position for me. So on frame zero, I'm going to click on the little keyframe icon next to my Z position. Notice how it turned solid red. That lets me know I've created a keyframe on this specific frame. In my frame range here, you can see there's a little keyframe icon as well to let me know that I've keyframed a property at this specific frame, in this case, frame zero. Now, what I can't tell from this view is what properties are, are keyframed or how many properties are keyframed. If you select it, you can see that, but just at, at a quick glance, I cannot. What I can then do is go to a different point in time, say frame 30, and I wanna point out that our keyframe icon now is only outlined red, letting us know that yes, we have keyframed this property previously, but there is not a keyframe on frame 30, okay? What we need to do now is change that property that we keyframed previously, in this case, the Z position, and I can move this however far I want, okay? Notice how this is outlined yellow, letting me know, hey, you've changed this property, and you need to keyframe it. So that's the difference between this and say After Effects is that using this particular method for creating keyframes, you have to keyframe it after each change to it. It doesn't automatically get recorded. Okay, we can now see that it's turned solid red again. One last little kind of visual indicator here. I'm still on frame 30. If I move this, Cinema 40 is saying, hey, you've changed this property. There's already a keyframe but it has not been recorded. And that's what that solid yellow is saying. So I can go ahead and click that one more time and that will keyframe it. You can also click on it again to remove a keyframe from whatever frame. You can also get some additional animation options if you right click on a property that has been keyframed. You can go to animation and you can even do things like add or delete keyframes, adding a track or copying a track, um, as well as some basic expression set driver set driven. I actually have a video about that if you want to dive into the, uh, something a little bit more complex, but today we're keeping it pretty simple. I can now hit play, and what we'll see is my animation will play back. Let's say I want to modify this animation, make some adjustments to it. We can do some basic timing changes based on what we can select and, and see in our frame range here. If you select a keyframe, you will actually see its key properties. You can see its key time as well as value. So you can make changes there, but that will only work if there's a single keyframe here. If I had keyframed multiple properties here and then made sure to select those, notice how for the key value it's saying mixed because there are now multiple keyframes um, at frame 30. So instead what we do, is expand our timeline. So I can hit the little keyframe icon here. Typically you do need to drag this up, right? And now we're taking a look at our timeline. And if you've ever worked in After Effects and worked with the graph editor, um, it's gonna look very familiar here pretty quickly. The default mode is Dope Sheet, which is an expanded view of our um, time uh, frame range down there in that you can see each property, you can see its keyframes and Cinema 4D does group position, rotation, and scale separately. So that can be nice to make it a little bit easier to see um, those different properties as well as kind of work with those different um, tracks inside your timeline. Okay, if you expand position, you can even see it broken down even further. You can see we have some keyframes for X and Y position on frame 30 because I set those, but our actual animation is on the Z position. And one of the reasons why I use this method of creating keyframes is because I have a lot more control over what properties get keyframed. Now they've made it a bit easier um, with auto key in that regard, but I still think um, this is the easiest and most straightforward way of creating animation. Okay, so that is our timeline. I'm sorry, our dope sheet mode. And it's really best for working with the timing as well as offsetting animation. If you want to really make adjustments, you want to go to F-curve mode. F-curve mode will allow you to see the function curve or F-curve for the animation you've created. Now it's important to know that when you're looking at this view, you can navigate it like a front view, like a left view. Um, so you can pan using alt middle mouse button or whatever the one, two, three 
uh, key is with the left mouse button. I'm not quite as familiar with those since I don't use them. You can also zoom. Now, when it comes to zooming, you can zoom horizontally if you move the mouse left and right. If you're using the alter option and right mouse button combination, not this, just the scroll wheel, okay? And if you move the mouse up and down, you will zoom in vertically. Now, you don't have to navigate a whole lot in here if you remember the shortcut keys H and S, as those are the same shortcut keys um, in your perspective view uh, for framing all or framing selected. And honestly, they're pretty interchangeable in our um, timeline down here. Okay, you can see how it did a pretty good job filling up my timeline as much as possible. Now, the type of keyframes we get by default here are in fact spline keyframes. So not linear like you might be used to in After Effects. Instead, we get these spline or smooth, or I can't remember if they're smooth or soft in After Effects, but we have Bezier handles. They have a slow in, slow out. If you want to change the keyframe type, what you can do is select both keyframes and then change the type to say linear. That will make sure we have a constant speed here. We lose our Bezier handles and this can give us a different type of animation. And so depending on the type of objects or elements we're animating, the look we're going for, sometimes it's easier just to use linear keyframes. Okay, we also have step interpolation. And I believe this is called hold in After Effects. Um, but this allows us to have a property change very quickly over the course of one frame. Uh, now it's pretty much like putting two keyframes right next to each other. The only difference is they don't need to be right next to each other. And the advantage of that is if you ever scale the animation shorter or longer, um, it's not going to kind of change the speed at which that um, animation happens over the course of that one frame. Okay, so the only keyframe I need to worry about here is the second one. This first one could be placed anywhere. Frame zero does make the most sense the majority of the time. But then if I ever want to change where this happens, I can just move this keyframe. Okay, and you can just select keyframes. You can click on keyframes. You can move them. Um, and if you hold shift, it will constrain it to whatever direction you move it first. So that's what allow, can allow you to move it um, up or down as well as horizontally, okay? So those are kind of the basics of keyframing. One other thing I will mention that can be very important or useful uh, if you have, say, multiple objects animated. So let's say I do this and I just have a bunch of objects here um, animated and there's, it's starting to fill up my um, timeline down here. That's where really these this group of options comes into play. Okay, by default, we have automatic mode turned on, which means Cinema 4D is gonna show us every object that is animated and all of its animated properties, okay? You can switch this to user mode and notice how everything disappears. You can then just drag in whatever objects you want to see, okay? I don't recommend using this unless you have a lot of objects um, as it can just be a little bit more tricky to manage than I recommend. So instead of that, what I recommend using is only object manager selection. And so that way you will only see the objects that you have selected. I have cube three here, I see cube three here. I select cube two here, I see cube two, cube two there. If I select multiple cubes, then I see them in here. So that's a great way to help kind of manage um, what objects and properties you are seeing in your timeline here if you are getting a bit overwhelmed with everything in your scene, okay? Obviously there's more options here, um, but you really won't use those a whole lot. You know, these are just different presets, um, ease in, ease out. It's kind of really resetting the spline interpolation back to its default. You can then lock different things or reset different things like your tangent angles, um, the handles themselves, okay? The length, all of that good stuff. Now with the timeline out of the way, we can go ahead and minimize that. And I want to finish up by just kind of talking about what we see in our perspective view here. So I'm gonna delete all of my cubes. And actually I'm gonna have to open up my timeline just a second to reset this back to the default um, spline interpolation. Though let's make sure I have my keyframes selected there. Awesome. Because what you are seeing in your perspective view here is now the motion path of that object. And it's a bit tricky to see, probably even more difficult on um, 
on YouTube with uh, the compression, but you will hopefully see these little dots, okay, along with the color here. Now that color is pretty much just like splines. It lets you know where the beginning of the um, motion path is, where the end of the motion path is. And the dots, which are really difficult to see, so um, like I said, I hope they're coming through. Zooming in really doesn't seem to make much of a difference, unfortunately. Um, but the dots, maybe it's actually better if I zoom out, indicate the speed. So um, if you look really, really closely, and you have to have the object selected, you'll see that the dots are going to be closer together at the ends because that's where we have um, that slow in and slow out. So things are slowing down, which means the speed is less, which means these dots are closer together and they spread out as um, our object is moving faster. And we can see that if I extend this. Notice how, well, I'm noticing it. I'm not sure how much you guys are able to notice. The dots get added more, um, and they get closer together um, and change based on how we adjust our timing here. Okay, so that is another port, important part of working with um, animation uh, in Cinema 4D. So that will do it for this video. If you could do me a huge favor, like the video, comment if there's anything else you would like to see, as well as subscribe. I'd appreciate it. And until next time, take care.